We are starting on an entirely new section here. It's really my introduction to tomography. I have other uh, lectures that I've given as kind of quick summaries of tomography. And, and what I start by meaning with the word tomography is travel time tomography that inverts for uh, velocities. And typically, that means uh, crustal tomography uh, or refraction tomography. And a lot of the examples that I use come from upper mantle tomography or uh, you know, like MOHO uh, uh, you know, crustal velocity tomography over a map. So we might work over maps. We might work over sections. We might work over 3D volumes. And um, we're going to start with the simple, um, the simple question, you know, how can we estimate lateral velocity variation uh, more accurately than, than with, say, NMO stacking? How can we estimate lat lateral velocity variation um, over the map, over the section, um, across the 3D volume? And this, uh, this topic of tomography is going to turn out to be very closely connected with migration, with advanced imaging that we've been talking about. But I need to bring that around after explaining what all of our fellow seismologists think of as tomography first. So we've got to spend some time uh, thinking about the uh, sort of classical seismological tomography and, and of course, Claire Bout's and Clayton's uh, views of that. Um, it was actually Clayton and Comer who constructed the very first 3D tomography of, uh, of the Earth's mantle. Uh, but they never published it um, because they, uh, they started with some very simple ideas. And there, were, um, there was not enough data to make the simple ideas work well enough. There were too many artifacts in the, uh, in the tomographic solution in the tomographic image. So uh, you know, it had to wait until other people could come up with sort of elaborations and um, tomographic uh, techniques that could deal with the lack of data that was, uh, was present at the time. You know, nowadays, especially, say, under North America, under Australia, under New Zealand, under Europe, under the Mediterranean. There is plenty of data, and these simple techniques uh, are working very well, although people are still using the elaborations as well. Uh, so you know, if you, if you talk about seismic imaging now outside the oil industry, um, uh, now, if you talk about it in, in the geothermal industry, seismic imaging means locating micro-earthquakes and trying to find faults from uh, uh, small um, uh, swarms of small earthquakes. And that's not, that's not exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, if you talk about uh, seismic imaging uh, in the oil industry, on the other hand, um, I'm sorry, uh, outside the oil industry and, and elsewhere among seismologists, the first thing they think of is uh, the transmission, travel time, velocity tomography that I'm going to discuss first. That's really the classic problem. And you know, Clayton, coming out of his, uh, his seismic imaging background, uh, he's really one of the first ones to um, to come up with it um, in the uh, seismological context. So it, it, it really is. It's very closely related in origin. It's very closely related mathematically. Um, but it's not closely related at all in practice to seismic imaging uh, as practiced by the oil, oil industry. 
which is what we've been mainly talking about in this class. So we're, in a way, uh, uh, going to catch up with uh, some very popular uh, seismological methods. So tomography gets defined in, in, more re in, in somewhat recent times as the reconstruction of an image from its projections. And what is a, a, a projection? It's a shadow. Okay? And in medicine, this was originally done using shadows, lights, film, x-rays. Okay? In the forward uh, data gathering process, uh, you would uh, illuminate the a body with uh, an x-ray source. And you would wrap a sheet of film around the, the uh, other side of the body. Um, uh, do I have to explain uh, to your generation what, what film is, like x-ray film? Or is that still somewhere back in the, the lore? Um, you know, it's, it's a 19th century uh, uh, technology. Um, and uh, it's a uh, uh, photosensitive sheet. Um, that then you have to uh, scan into a computer. So um, uh, the X-ray source il illuminates uh, the body, and something that has a different uh, density, or at least a different, um, uh, shall we say, cross section to um, to X-rays, this different absorption factor for X-rays will create a shadow, and that shadow will project in the direction, notice how the shadow is being cast, in the direction that the x-rays are shining, in the direction of the rays of the x-rays. And um, uh, that part of the film will not get exposed, and it'll be left white, um, since it's uh, you know regular negative film, whereas the, um, the part that, that receives you know, more of the x-rays through the rest of the body is um, going to be um, exposed more and will be black. Okay, so uh, what they actually used to do is um, they, would, uh, uh, they would do what's called back projection for an inverse process. They'd wrap the film around a, a round plate of smoked glass, okay, and they would illuminate it from the outside and project the shadow on the film back into the smoke glass and uh, image the body. So uh, this uh, anomaly, you know, maybe it's just a bone, maybe it's something else that the doctors are trying to find. So the the um, uh, the forward process creating the data, you know, going from the model space, which is the body, to the data space, which is the film. Um, that's, called, um, uh, that's called forward projection. And then this process of uh, reversing the direction of the rays and uh, shining back into a smoked glass uh, model space from the film data space, that's called back projection. Uh, really, the resolution and accuracy of back projection, and this is going to hold even when we apply back projection to migration, and and you know really any other process, the resolution and accuracy of the back projection gets con controlled principally by the distribution of light rays. Okay, so if we have exactly one ray to forward project, and then back project. Okay, So here we're back projecting that one ray. And we have that, uh, we've got the film wrapped around the, the smoke glass. And we've, here's the, uh, the shadow of the uh, body, uh, the white spot on the, on the film, on the negative film. Of course, it's going to cast a shadow all the way across the smoke glass. All right. Now the, the location of the of the body is is in there somewhere, okay, but where, right? Um, and I forgot to go to the correct mode. There we go. 
All right, so the body is in there somewhere, and yes, it is in the shadow, but how do we locate it properly? All right, we have to back project many rays. That's what gives us imaging. So we cast a shadow all the way across there, but then there's another ray that saw the, the, saw the anomaly from, um, from this other direction, and so we cast a shadow that crosses, and so they, the shadows reinforce where they cross, and there's another ray that, that found the shadow uh, over here in the data space, and we back project that one, and it crosses at the same place. And so just like uh, Kirchhoff migration, we build up where these, these different shadows coincide, where these different rays all intersect. And, and the part where they don't intersect, where they're all spread out, gets relatively weaker. Okay. So um, uh, it's that, you know, it, it has less to do with the, um, the nature uh, in, in classical tomography. The uh, quality of the back projection, the quality, you know, what is the amount of anomaly recovered, okay? What's the quality of the image? How many artifacts there, there are? It has a lot less to do with the size and uh, of the anomaly, it has a lot less to do with the mathematics. It has a lot less to do with the uh, the type of, of sources you use. What it has mostly to do with is where those rays are. Where are the sources? Where are the receivers? What is their path? What is the path of each ray across the model space? And that's. You know, there's lots of other problems in tomography, but that's the, the issue you've got to address first. When you have a tomographic result, you've got to first address the issue of do you have sufficient ray coverage for what you're trying to um, image. Now, of course, uh, you know, all tomography is computerized now. Um, even in, in uh, medical applications, I don't think anyone uses film anymore. Um, and, and, you know, when you, when you can put your entire, um, entire model space into a laboratory or into a CAT scan machine, then you can design in good ray coverage. Okay. So, you know, what the CAT scan machines do is they, they illuminate you with x-rays, uh, hopefully not too strong, you know, at thousands of points in a full circle. And I think they do offsets so that all the rays don't intersect at exactly the same place in the middle either. So um, they, uh, uh, you know, they'll move the source and the detector together, and move all around the body, and then they'll they'll move, you know, in and out of the page, and and uh, uh, they'll build up slices uh, for a full 3D tomography. And then, uh, you know, in the computer, you take each ray and you you cast that, that shadow from that ray back over the, your discretized body. And um, what you do is you take whatever amplitude uh, that, uh, you know, that's recorded by the x-ray detector, that amplitude is just splashed back across the whole ray, across every uh, cell in the model space that this ray intersects. Um, you know, and it's averaged over the ray path, and you think, you know, how can that work? Okay, and we'll we'll, you know, we'll go through the mathematics of of why that can work at all. I mean, obviously, for one ray, it doesn't work at all. It's when you have thousands of rays that it works great. Okay, and if our, you know, the problem in in seismology is not so much the um, anymore the number of rays we have, the number of observations, it's really their spatial and directional distribution. You know, are we looking at, at all of our anomalies from the same direction? That's a problem. Um, are there parts of the uh, the model um, that are uh, that are in the null space of, of our formal model? Um, you know, because no rays, even though we've got lots of rays, no rays go there. 
That's another problem. Okay. Um, and and we can also get inconsistent data because the uh, um, because the observations um, uh, may not fit the uh, linearized model that we uh, that we've applied to derive the tomography. Okay, and so the data may might make no sense to the model, uh, yet still be quite valid data. And of course, there's the issue of noise as well. So in seismology, for travel time tomography to get velocity, um, we got to make a couple of assumptions. Um, you know, the, the simplest thing to do is first assume the validity of the ray approximations to the wave equation. And what this is is really an infinite frequency approximate, uh, infinite frequency assumption. And, and if you think back to medical tomography, you know, with X-rays, um, you know, what are the wavelengths of X-rays? I mean, I think there's tiny fractions of an angstrom. So, you know, the infinite frequency assumption is pretty darn good for X-rays. No problem there. Um, but for uh, um, um, for seismology, you know, we don't often have the high frequencies we really want. Uh, but we're going to assume we do. Okay, so there's there's this assumption number one. Um, we're also going to assume that we uh, that we are going to have to evaluate accuracy and resolution problems that result from our what is usually poor ray coverage. We may have lots of rays, but their coverage, their their you know the location and direction of the of the rays is not uh, not ever ideal okay and and this is handled with these uh, I'm sure you've heard about these checkerboard tests um, you know they were just being invented uh, when I wrote these notes um, uh, these checkerboard tests are are done they're they're synthetics model spaces and and you use them to calculate um, synthetic data sets but you uh, you use the real ray set, so you don't have the you don't have the real anomalies, and uh, thus your data are entirely synthetic. But you, at least you have the real geometry. So I'll show you how to uh, uh, how to evaluate ray coverage using the real ray set. Okay, now uh, uh, as I mentioned. You know, this transmission tomography, uh, that's the classical seismological tomography. It's the back projection of travel times for velocities. And really, classically, it's the back projection of delays for um, slowness perturbations. And then there's, um, there's reflection tomography. And reflection tomography, as I use it, um, is the back projection of amplitudes for reflectivities. And what do we know that as? That's actually migration. Okay. Except we're going to, you know, when we get into real reflection tomography later on, um, we're going to actually care now much more about what the amplitudes are, not just the phase and the timing. Okay. Just basically AVO, is that what you're saying? AVO is involved, but there's more to it than that. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's talk about transmission tomography in its classical sense. We find um, where waves bounce, you know, which is so we can still use reflections. We can use transmission tomography on reflection data sets and how rapidly the waves propagate and really raise is what we're going to. Uh, um, what we're going to uh, be using, we're going to find slow spatial variations of velocity. Okay, and the reason for that is, you know, you have uh, some sort of random distribution of uh, of anomalies. You know, these could even be uh, cavities, or maybe they're ball bearings. You know, it could be a combination of fast and slow anomalies. You hit it with a perfectly straight plane wave, and the anomalies are going to distort. That plane wave, but with with time, you know, 
that those distortions heal, okay, and you know by the time you get to the other borehole, you know maybe you set off a plane wave in a in a borehole um, uh, uh, two hundred meters down the road, and you get to the other borehole, and um, you know you're looking at a, a quite a smooth um, wave front. It does it does still have advances and delays. You know, you see when the when the line of receivers uh, um, catches that uh, that the passage of that wave front, and some receivers are, uh, you know, they they see the wave front earlier than others. Okay, that see it later, and so uh, you know the receivers see a delta t, you know, say related to the uh, relative to the average arrival time across this array of receivers. All right, so that uh, or relative to some Background model, right? The background model here is this uh, a straight up and down plane wave, okay? And so uh, we can calculate uh, delta t's relative to the average arrival time. And some delta t's are negative. That means that they're early, they're advanced. And some delta t's are positive, which means they're late. They're positive delays. That's why I like to use the term delay. Uh, because that tells you what sense the delta t is in. Okay, so this is a uh, a cross hole experiment. Okay, which I drew uh, in there. Let's look at some examples that um, tomography, uh, you know, still gets applied to. All right, um, there's uh, refraction. Uh, you can uh, you can apply it to uh, seismic surveys. You can apply it to regional earthquake records, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, um, and uh, as you know, uh, you've got some sort of refractor. Hopefully, its dip is not too um, too much, and it's uh, and hopefully it's um, uh, uh, hopefully it's uh, relatively planar. It's not uh, not terribly complex in structure, and you. Um, uh, you get a lot of observations over the top of it, maybe in different directions across the map. Uh, you know, maybe from your seismic shots into your uh, reflection receivers. Uh, maybe from uh, uh, small earthquakes, which are still above the Moho, and um, and still forming uh, uh, PN uh, refractions uh, along the Moho and. Uh, um, and uh, uh, you're, uh, you're seeing a certain amount of delay due to the uh, refracted leg of the, of the refraction. You're seeing a certain amount of the delay is due to the, uh, of the time going down from the source. You know, and of course, if, it's, if there's an earthquake, and you know, you'll see an advance. If the earthquake is at depth, you'll see an advance, because it takes less time to get down to the moho. And there's a certain amount of delay due to the velocity um, Changes uh, as the ray is coming back up to the receiver, as a head wave, as a PN phase. So um, uh, you can get you can use this kind of uh, refraction tomography. You can get the velocity of the refractor and and how that velocity changes in space. You can also get velocity in the in the shallower areas. You know, especially. Um, around the sources and, and well under the sources and under the stations. Okay, um, you know this is the problem that that Satish uh, did his thesis on mainly and solved for um, um, for uh, shallow refraction you know engineering refraction surveys. Uh, tomography was used really early and was developed. Looking at uh, the arrivals of uh, teleseismic waves to um, arrays of seismometers across uh, small regions such, such as Southern California, there were a few regions in the world where where there were uh, decently sized arrays of uh, of uh, seismometers, you know, covering a uh, uh, a whole uh, a whole region at uh, some reasonable spacing. And uh, you take a very, very distant earthquake, 
And you could imagine that over that small region, the, uh, the arrival from that er some arrival from that earthquake you could think of as a, uh, as a plane wave, close enough. Um, you know, say over all of Southern California, if the earthquake is in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and then we look for the delays caused by the stuff in the upper mantle, uh, or maybe the crust. Okay, um, you know where the uh, slow stuff is going to delay the arrivals, and the fast stuff is going to advance the arrivals. So, um, uh, and you have to have some sort of model, you know, some reference time to get your delay against. So you're you observe the the arrival time at this receiver, which is at uh, some distance x or some location x anyway, and um, you have a reference uh, a mo reference time, which predicts when that uh, you know globally, uh, given the location of the earthquake and the location of the station, and the you know radial structure of the Earth, when it will arrive. Okay, so that takes into account the slant of the plane wave. And and should leave you only the distortions uh, from structure that are under your array and and different um, from the uh, um, the reference model, the radial model. And then here is what is sometimes also gets called reflection tomography, and that is using and, and Satish addressed this in his uh, in his thesis as well. It's actually his his very first paper. The one in geophysics is on this kind of tomography. Um, it's getting the velocities of the material above a reflector. So, you know, as Satish did, if you can uh, invert for both the velocities and the structure of the reflector at the same time, you can solve that problem. If for some reason, you know, like with the Moho, you think you have a well-controlled or, or mostly flat reflector over a small area, you can you can do this as well. Um, you know, in general, we don't know right away where 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 either of these are. You know, where the velocity anomalies are, we don't know where the reflector is. Okay, um, and uh, that's the problem that you know Satish saw this diagram and he uh, he went and pursued his thesis and and solved it where we didn't know either one. Okay, um, but uh, uh, attempts up to then had uh, had. Said so either you know we know something about the velocity distribution, or we know something about the reflector reflector structure. Okay, so just to start off, you know we we constrain and control one, and that gives us the ability to um, uh, to get around the velocity structure trade off, and uh, and find the other one. Okay, um, and what's one of you know one of the really great results in Satish's thesis was that. This velocity structure trade-off is not as severe as a true uncertainty principle. If you have enough rays in enough directions, uh, you can. Uh, it's it's not a strict uncertainty principle. You can avoid the velocity structure trade-off. And uh, uh, my classmate Chris Stork, uh, Christoph Stork, who I think still works for um, Exxon. Um, if I remember right, um, he uh, uh, he also he worked on this uh, on the velocity structure trade-off explicitly, um, and um, and found that uh, uh, you know in a standard reflection survey, even you know when the when the um, uh, it, it, even if you don't know anything about the reflection reflector structure, if you don't know anything about the velocity. Yet you have enough as many rays as you would get in a standard reflection survey, then there is data that can get you around the velocity structure trade-off. Okay, when I wrote these notes, I didn't know necessarily. Maybe maybe it, w it would turn out to be a true uncertainty principle, and it turned out it didn't. Okay, so let's recall the the radon transform. Um, Really, just a generalized expression of the slant stack, you know, written as a uh, continuous uh, uh, here, written as a continuous integral uh, rather than as a summation. And so we have some two D field, you know, maybe it's x and z, 
you know, for our uh, for our uh, reflection tomography uh, example, um, maybe it's uh, x and y, easting and northing. You know, getting uh, like uh, my classmate uh, Tom Hearn did, um, getting PN velocities across Southern California and how they varied, and even later on uh, um, their anisotropy, which is really interesting. Um, so uh, you have your uh, your source and your receiver, you know, out. Uh, your source is somewhere out here at the beginning of the ray, and the receiver is out here uh, at the end of the ray. And um, uh, you're looking at an area here that's traversing a uh, an anomaly, and you um, you know you wonder what effect is that anomaly going to have on the ray? What shadow is it going to cast? Okay, so you begin it. Integrating along this uh, along the ray, and the ray, you know, let's let's talk about this as if it was uh, map coordinates. Okay, the ray's got some angle; it's got some azimuth. And uh, where is that ray? Well, of course, it's the equation of a straight line. Okay, that uh, that creates that. Um, although the radon transform doesn't require it to be a straight line, but right here. I'm going to define the ray by uh, y northing is equal to the inter the the uh, northing intercept a plus the slope b times x, which is the easting. Okay, so that gives the uh, that gives the um, the the ray path right. Whatever the path is, we integrate over that. Okay, um, and here you know here's where we put in the uh, the ray geometry. Okay, and that's what makes it an easy uh, uh, a slant stack instead of a, a even more generalized radon transform, right? We have um, uh, a here's uh, a plus b x. That's the that's equal to y, okay, and that shows us where we are integrating along through the uh, the model f, and we get capital F, which is the shadow, the projection, the uh, the forward projection. And the shadow is in terms of the ray intercepts and the ray slopes, or the ray azimuths. Now, we showed through the Fourier transform that the radon transform is linear and has an inverse. And even if you, um, even if you were to um, you know, have it not be a, a linear uh, a path through the, uh, through the model, um, you would still end up uh, being able to uh, cast the, uh, the the radon transform into the Fourier domain, and you'd still be able to derive the uh, the inverse. So uh, that's not so important. But uh, what we can what we can do is is state the inverse, and it's it's quite easy for uh, the straight paths. Okay, the um, uh, the inverse uh, to the, the forward problem, the back projection, is just another radon transform, except we're doing uh, radon transforms now of the slant stack of the capital F. And we reverse the, uh, the sense of the, uh, um, uh, the we reverse the, the sense of the, uh, um, of the uh, call it NMO here, uh, of the move out. Right, because now we're calculating a right the intercept, so a is equal to y minus b x, okay, and then there's uh, there's b, that's the slope. So we're we're just doing a slant, we're basically doing an inverse slant stack, okay, and and the inverse slant stack is really just this this slant stack with a change in sign here, all right, and. Um, uh, and that gets us an estimate of the uh, model, okay, little f, in terms of x and y. Now we also know from inverting the radon transform using you know Thorson's uh, uh, Fourier method that uh, there's this rho filter, okay, which here is written as capital omega in terms of uh, of x and y. Maybe uh, maybe Clayton wrote this as as uh, omega just because he disagreed with with Thorson calling it rho. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where the omega came from. I have to admit. So um, 
it's uh, and obviously here we have some kind of two D filter. Okay. Now now think about rho in terms of uh, you know one component at a time. So rho in terms of say k sub y. Okay. It's it's this uh, frequency domain filter that you uh, that you saw before. Basically cuts out the uh, the direct current component. Cuts out the zero frequency component. And emphasizes the uh, as a high pass filter, it emphasizes the uh, the higher frequencies. So, um, you know, we have a uh, we have a model, which is uh, notice the model has a um, um, you know it can have a, an off center anomaly, right? The uh, the the average that the, the Zero frequency component of this model with one in this area and zero outside, you know, the zero frequency component is about a half, the, an amplitude of a half. Okay, but what we're because of the row filter, what we're going to get out of the tomographic reconstruction is is always going to be centered at zero because we're not allowed any direct direct current component. Okay. Uh, you know, in in case of y or case of x, in this case. So the um, um, what we're going to see is is where we had zero in the model, we're going to see minus a half, and where we had one in the model, we're going to see plus a half. You know, in this tomographic reconstruction. Now this uh, this idea is is also going to. Uh, um, is also going to help us uh, uh, to. Um, uh, it's going to help us guide our our linearization of the problem. All right. So let's uh, uh, let's define now mathematically what uh, uh, what we're doing. We're going to set up some equations that we're going to be able to uh, uh, find an inverse an inverse for. And um, uh, it's really these equations are really just going to be a different way of expressing the uh, radon transform. Okay. Hey John. Can yeah. You explain that again. You said that it was an NMO, and then you said it was a slant stack. I guess I'm just a little confused. I'm 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 using you know move out as a very generic term, right? So here. Here the move out is is positive as x increases. The move out, you know, the the, the delay increases, and here the the move out is is negative as x increases. The delay decreases or the the time decreases or the a decreases. The intercept decreases. So why did you say slant stack? That's the part I didn't understand. Because uh, as I've written them here, with these linear move outs, you know. A plus bx okay. and y minus bx. That's exactly a slant stack. Okay, um, but you know, we're what we're and, and we're going to come back to the the radon transform expression. You know, which is just a generalized slant stack. Um, but first, I've got to I've got to convince you that that, and I got to show you what the problem setup is for curved rays. Okay. Because that's not that's not so obvious how that connects to the slant stack or to the p tau transform, right? So let's set up the let's set up the math. All right. <clears throat> so um, you know here's our map area, here's our earthquake, here's our station, and our ray takes this path, which uh, as you can see it's not straight, okay, and um, Across the map here, there's some velocity distribution. You know, v uh, varies in x; it varies in y. So laterally variable velocity—that's the problem we're trying to solve now. We're trying to figure out how to evaluate that. Okay. Now let's define a field S, which is the inverse of the velocity at each point x and y. Okay. So uh, it's just the inverse. The slowness, you know, the inverse of velocity is slowness. So that's the, if you like, amplitude in the model space. Okay. 
So if you integrate along little elements dl, little links dl along the ray, you know wherever it is, okay, um, and you multiply the um, uh, you multiply the slowness at this uh, this little uh, spot that dl is passing through. You multiply that slowness times dl, right? That's uh, uh, seconds per meter times uh, meters, so you get seconds, and you integrate all that for all little dl's, and that gives you a total time. Okay. Now uh, we're going to look at this more formally later, but what we actually are going to do is um, is we're going to instead of talking about the total slowness, the exact inverse of velocity, we're going to look at a slowness perturbation. And the uh, what we're going to need to uh, and I'll show you again. I'll show you later. You know exactly how. Um, but the delta s is going to be much much less than s. And then instead of talking about a total travel time, which is what this calculates here, right? The um, we're going to be our data are going to be a delta t, a delay, which again is thought to be much much less. Than the total time t. Okay, so uh, uh, but I'm going to drop the the deltas here, and uh, um, you know this is a uh, some early notation of Clayton's, um, where he didn't want to he just wanted to introduce the uh, uh, as I want to here I want to introduce the the uh, the concepts and the math without uh, without dealing with the linearization problem just yet. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the time t. T sub r is the delay time of ray number r. Okay, this ray, it's ray number r. Okay, um, and the next ray, well, maybe that's a ray in a totally different place. Okay, but you know, for some reason, that's ray r plus one. And then a totally different ray in some other place, maybe or maybe not crossing these other rays, you know that'll be ray r plus two, and so forth. So we got some arbitrary numbering of the uh, of the rays. Okay. Uh, likewise with the model. Okay, s sub b. That's the slowness perturbation, the delta s, of block number b. All right. And how do I number the blocks? Well, you know, I could start, you know, one, two, three, four, five, out to ten thousand, and then ten thousand one in the next row, and um, or maybe uh, maybe I'm building a three D model and I'm going to uh, I'm going to number them, um, uh, you know, going down first. So you know, I'm going to have uh, block one through a thousand uh, going down all up here. Um, or maybe uh, maybe I've got an oak tree, or a uh, um, I've got a, uh, a finite element model, and my blocks, uh, uh, even aside from not being cubical, uh, you know, maybe they're uh, uh, tetrahedrons, um, and maybe they change shi size and shape, you know, in some sort of random uh, um, uh, triangulated array, okay. And so then I'm just going to number the blocks however I number them. Okay, I'll, I'll have some. I got to have some way of keeping track of them, right? And so um, you know, and all we got to all we got to be able to do is uh, is keep track. Okay, you know where is block B, and um, and uh, uh, and and where you know what is ray R, where what is block B. And what is the what is the delay time in uh, uh, for ray r? Okay, that's uh, that's a piece of data. And what's the um, um, what's the slowness perturbation in block b, block number b? That's uh, that's in the model space. Okay. So um, now here's where I really need to keep track of all the geometries. I've got to make this matrix, and you can see it's just a um, what do you call that? Uh, um, 
uh, second order matrix. It's it's a you know it's a uh, uh, n by m matrix. It's a two D matrix, um, and uh, each element of the matrix is the length of ray segment number R of the segment of ray number R in block B. Okay, L sub R B. Okay. So easy to think about on a you know two D grid with uh, with uh, square uh, blocks, right? So here's block B, and here's ray R, and um, uh, and and here's the uh, you know ray R is shooting uh, cutting through the corner of block B here, and he, so here then is the length of ray R in block B L sub R B. Okay, and it's that length, that number of meters right there. Um, let's say over here, where I'm pointing, that's block B plus one. What's the length of ray R in block B plus one? This ray here, okay, uh, does it intersect this block B plus one? No. So the ray length is zero. And that's really all you need to keep track of. Okay. Now, if you're going to do a, a, a tomography for uh, anisotropy, yeah, you got to keep track of the direction. Okay. But all we're doing here is is we're going to sum up lengths of of ray r in block B times the slowness of block B, right? And that gives us the delay. Due to for ray r, it gives us the delay due to block b, and we sum up all those delays over all the blocks, and that gives us the delay uh, t sub r for ray r. Okay, now you know if I'm looking in here at this you know massive grid, I mean ray r is going to cut through you know 0.1 percent of the blocks, so most you know for block b, most of um, most of the uh, uh, most of the L's are zero, okay, because the the length of ray of ray R in in most blocks is zero, because ray R only travels only passes through a few of the blocks, okay. So you construct that matrix that relates, you know, the rays to the blocks, and and most of the entries in that matrix are zero, right. And um, um, and then you just do this uh, summation, okay, across all block all block numbers. You know this isn't a summation across x or y or northing or easting or depth or anything like that. It's just a summation across block numbers, however they're distributed. So they could be, uh, you know, they could be uh, spherical shells if you if 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 you are doing that sort of problem. Um, they could be cylindrical shells, um, all sorts of crazy things. But you know, the geometry is simple enough that it always, always works just this easily. So we can put this summation into matrix form. Okay. So we have a um, uh, what I like to call an information matrix, which is you know this is what I call the matrix uh, L. So it's capital L. It's got two uh, bars underneath it. So in this notation, that's a, a matrix, and um, each of these, uh, you know, the 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 data. I'm sorry, the model space, the slownesses, right? That's just a a, a column vector of the, um, and in that column vector uh, for the model, um, there's uh, you know, n b number of uh, blocks, and each of those blocks has an entry for the slowness perturbation. Okay, and then the uh, uh, data the data vector is also a column vector. Okay, and uh, it's just got all of the rays in whatever order they're they're in by number, right? Um, by their R number, and there's a delay entered in each uh, uh, in each uh, 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 level of the column vector. And then here's this, uh, um, you know, each each entry in this uh, information matrix 
is a um, is a ray length of ray R in block B. Okay. So um, all right, with this uh, this matrix form here, uh, you're probably already saying, oh yeah, it's got a classic least square solution, right? I just um, uh, you know L is L is has dimensions of uh, uh, n r times uh, n b, right? It's n r by n b number of blocks times the number of rays. That's very rarely going to be square, right? So you need to make a you know to invert a matrix, it's got to be square first, okay? So uh, uh, you know a, a good trick. Uh, is to take the transpose of the of the L matrix and pre-multiply that by L, right? That creates a square matrix, right? So we've we've pre-multiplied both sides of this uh, matrix equation by L transpose. Okay, so L transpose times the data space T, the data vector T, is equal to L transpose applied to L, or as I'll say, L transpose L. Um, and that that uh, square matrix applied to S. Okay, so now we want to find uh, the inverse to L transpose L. At least it's possible now uh, because we got a square matrix. Um, now L transpose L uh, with the pre-multiplication of L transpose, um, it's. Uh, 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 it's NB, let's see, L transpose is uh, NB times NB. So it's got a number of, um, uh, of elements in L transpose L that's uh, you know, NB squared. Uh, just a little example here. If we have a 2D model of 100 by 100 blocks, then L transpose L is um, um, yeah, 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 4. So um, uh, you know, even though this is only a, uh, you know, only it could only be uh, four or eight gigabytes, um, I think that would still break uh, the uh, the uh, um, that would still break MATLAB. I don't know. Maybe uh, maybe somebody will tell me differently. Um, so um, you know, this is a little bit bigger problem. And, you know, in hundred by hundred blocks, that's that's not much. That's not much resolution. So. Um, uh, you know, uh, like uh, Tom Hearn's early early tomographies were probably 500 by 500 blocks. Um, so uh, <clears throat> you know, it's it's a, it's a it's a difficult uh, uh, matrix inversion problem. Um, you know, even today, okay, even for a relatively simple model, uh, you can't just shove it through MATLAB. Uh, you know, we'll get there. But of course, by then, uh, our you know we'll have way more data, and we'll want way higher resolutions. Um, now, uh, uh, each element of L transpose L, uh, which is uh, that, that's what's more properly called the uh, uh, covariance matrix, um, the model covariance matrix, uh, L transpose L sub i j. Each element gives a measure of how well the data connect. connect between the ith and the jth blocks, you know, if if there are no rays that pass through both block i and block j, then the covariance is going to be zero. Okay, um, and if there's a lot of rays that pass through um, both block i and j, then it's going to that that entry is going to have a high covariance. All right. So um, uh, the tomographic approximation, okay, and and this is the uh, you know this is the brilliant idea here, um, and and you know Clayton Clayton worked this out, um, you know just. Uh, uh, as I like to say, heuristically, he just thought up how to solve this. You know, he could he could express it in terms of the matrices, and uh, instead of instead of you know trying to to find a way to uh, 
you know, use uh, what is it called Gaussian elimination to solve that to invert that big uh, matrix. He said, "Oh, I think I can solve this, um, you know, just with a simple procedure. Okay, with with back projection is what he was thinking of. Okay, um, and uh, I think it was probably uh, probably his student uh, Gene um, um, Gene Humphreys, who uh, is now at uh, um, University of Oregon." Um, uh, Gene Humphreys is the one who who first uh, expressed this uh, um, in this in this uh, matrix uh, format. Okay. Um, so um, the tomographic approximation is to use only the diagonal of L transpose L in inverting L transpose L. Okay, so we're going to ignore. So we have uh, uh, the solution for, and, and here I I wrote it, and um, boy, I wish I knew what that smudge was. Now, um, let's see. That's L transpose, probably still sub n n. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, uh, you know the diagonal of L transpose L we can say is L transpose L sub n n, okay, and that's easy to invert. Um, except right, there's going to be some blocks. If there's a block that no ray ever hits, right, L transpose L sub n n is going to be zero. So we got to partition those out and not use them, right? Because we um, uh, well, or maybe uh, use a, a water level or add a, an epsilon, right? So um, various ways of handling that, okay? Um, because there's always there's always null spaces in the model. Um, so uh, L transpose L sub n n inverse, okay? That's easy. That's just the the inverse of of each of those uh, elements along the diagonal of L transpose L. Okay, which is easy as long as none of them are zero. Okay, so that's just a little bit of scaling there, right? And then you apply that to um, that scaling, right? To uh, L sub n n uh, trans transpose. Okay, applied to um, uh, applied to the uh, uh, the column vector of of data, which is the delays, and that gets you you know that uh, multiplication. Uh, this is a vector times a matrix times a scalar, right? Um, that uh, um, that gets you uh, a uh, a slowness, right? So this vector, this column vector here, times the matrix, that's a summation, and that's a summation of um, uh, uh, over all the rays, okay? That uh, that. Uh, at least all the rays that intersect this block B, right, of um, the uh, 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 the time uh, uh, T sub R, which is the time of, of each ray, okay, times the uh, uh, you know, and we're summing, we're making this summation for one block B, right? So um, uh, we're essentially looking at one row of this equation here, and. Um, <clears throat> So we take the time, uh, the delay of ray R, times the um, um, uh, the length of that ray in that um, uh, in that block, okay, the block B here that we're getting, and uh, um, and we sum them up for all the rays. We sum up that product for all the rays, okay. So, so how, how do we do this in practice? Okay, we could be uh, uh, sitting here observing a seismic network, and we should be doing this here right now. And maybe it's one of my great career failures that we're not doing this right now. Okay, um, every time there's an earthquake, we observe it at several rays, and um, and we can we can estimate a delay, right? So we have a time for that 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 ray that receiver from that new earthquake. Okay, 
and um, uh, and we can have uh, we can calculate the uh, get an estimate of the length of uh, of that ray in uh, in in any given block B. Okay, so um, uh, so we uh, we accumulate then. Uh, you know, we're accumulating a sum. We've got a uh, uh, an array of we got two arrays. Okay, so there's a, a numerator array where we're accumulating the sum of the uh, the t's times l's. Okay, and then there's a denominator array where we're accumulating the sum of the l squares. All right, and if any. Um, uh, if at any time I want to see, well, what's the current uh, slowness estimate, slowness perturbation estimate for uh, block B, I just go in and take uh, the numerator array at block B, its value, and divide it by the uh, denominator array value at block uh, um, at, at uh, block B, right? So all I have to keep here, uh, I don't have to keep around um, all. Um, um, I don't have to keep around all the all the data. All I've got is say is two arrays, each of them with uh, n b elements, the number of blocks. So um, uh, you know we're just back projecting one ray at a time, and we're only, we're not having to store all the rays. We're not having to uh, you know assuming that we have a way of calculating these l's. Okay, we may or may not store all of them, right? Um, and in fact, uh, generally, we we uh, it's only when we're summing in that ray that's when we make the calculation of of all the l's for that ray. So there's an array of uh, of links, but we throw that away when we're done with the ray, and we just accumulate into these two uh, um, into these two arrays, and then we can query them any time to take the uh, the quotient and get us the slowness estimate. Um, and you can see here that what we're essentially doing is we're taking a time and we're dividing by a uh, a length, right? And that's what we need for the slowness. But what it looks like we're doing is we're taking a time and we're not inverting. We're multiplying the time by the length, you know. And then this is you know this is kind of a normalization that comes out later. And so a lot of time, what you actually see. Are these um, um, are these uh, uh, you know images of the numerator uh, array you know plotted out to be a, a map or a section um, and uh, you know you only come you, you, you actually might not uh, come by and divide by the uh, denominator uh, for instance um, you know there's going to be lots of lots of blocks that have uh, zero length. And if you're if you're just looking at the numerator array, you don't have to worry about that. You got zero result in those blocks, and and the fact that you're dividing by you should be dividing by zero squared that doesn't have to worry you. Okay, so this is um, uh, all right. The tomographic approximation allows us to do this by using only the diagonal of L transpose L, and by doing that we're we're turning the inversion problem into a, a very simple, you know, scalar correction, and actually we might not even bother with that correction. If we're just trying to see the geometry of structure, we might not bother with the scaling, and we might just do the this is L transpose times T, and that's what's done in this upper uh, in the numerator here, and that's the whole thing. We might we might even publish those results without ever doing the scaling. Um, and uh, uh, so that's uh, um, that's really the uh, um, uh, that's really the the advance that that tomography represented here. You know, instead of kind of a hairy. Um, uh, a hairy inversion problem, uh, which is a lot easier to solve these days than it used to be. We've really just got a simple summation, 
a summation of a very simple product. And, and where we don't have data, um, it just doesn't get, it doesn't get put in. And if we don't bother to divide by the scaling, we don't even worry about it. Um, so that's what's a, a back projection. A back projection uh, tomography is using just the diagonal of L transpose L in, its, in inverting it. That's all that we're uh, all that we're doing, and it, it breaks down into this extremely simple back projection procedure. You know where we're not inverting; we're we're multiplying, and and what Clairbout says is we're processing. We're not we're not invert inverting; we're processing, multiplying the the data by the possibly um, the possibly zero. Uh, ray length. Okay, so um, I'm going to leave it there.